All right, so yes, I'm Ross Blotcher, and I am the co-host with Carrie Poppy of a little show we've been working on for the last six and a half years called Oh No, Ross and Carrie. Uh, a lot of you expressed some recognition, or you're just very warm and welcoming before. Can we do like a George Robb style uh, synchronous clap if you haven't ever heard the show? And go. Excellent. Oh, good, because there's going to be a lot of review here, and I was worried. <laughs> All right, so you can't tell too much from the title about what we do. You may have seen in the photo we were carrying dowsing rods and uh, a pendulum, so that might have given you a hint. But the title itself just tells you our names and uh, insinuates that maybe we're some kind of troublemakers, because, oh no. So what we do is we investigate uh, claims of the paranormal, uh, religion, pseudoscience, fringe science, uh, anything that has a claim attached to it that might conflict with what we know about the world from science, uh, at least you know uh, our understanding of science. We're not professional scientists or anything like that. Uh, so uh, everything in blue is kind of in our purview, and we have to be sort of selective about what we allow uh, uh, on top of that. So. Uh, for example, I once told a friend about this, and he said, oh, I know how to get you into a furry convention. And I got all excited, like, whoa, furries. And then I realized there's no paranormal claim. There's no, like, extraordinary, nothing extraordinary needs to be believed. Well, maybe, uh, <laughs> to be a furry. So that is, that is what we do, and we kind of constricted ourselves early on uh, to those points. But we are just two individuals who happen to be uh, very excited by other people's beliefs. We want to see them in action. And so what we do is we do this all firsthand. We show up so you don't have to. Uh, that is our phrase. So th these are the things that we have investigated so far in our six and a half years. Uh, and uh, oh, people are reacting to certain things. I'm curious to know. But uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's quite a few things that cover a broad range of topics. And that's not all of them. This brings you up to present, at least everything that's been released. We're always working on about three or four or five different things at any one given time. Uh, but yeah, what we do is we show up so you don't have to, again. We just go there and do the thing. So there's a variety of uh, just examples here. This is kind of a very small smattering of the things that we've done. We don't bill ourselves necessarily as a skeptical show. We, we don't use the word too much, uh, but that's obviously what we're doing. We're applying critical thinking to what we encounter, uh, and we're rating all of these things on a, on a few different scales. Uh, we put the show in iTunes under religion and spirituality. There's a little other category uh, under there, and so we do really well in that other category. We've been <laughs> top of that for years. And uh, see, I, I don't know if I even need to explain all of these. We've got, oh no, I won't do it. Oh, I'll let the mystery live, live on. So, uh, so yeah, so we show up so you don't have to, and I'm going to uh, curtail the obvious questions where people say, oh, wait a second, you're saying, well, I can't do it because you did it? Of course not. By saying we show up so you don't have to, that just means you don't have to. There are many other possibilities within that spectrum, uh, everywhere from, yeah, go ahead, we, we think you should do this, to, uh, yeah, don't do this, this is bad, this is dangerous. So, lots of possibilities. It's just like when you accidentally say, I could care less. What you're saying is that you care, uh, because we, we've just eliminated the one sentiment you meant to express, and now you're saying, maybe you care a little, maybe you care a whole lot, we don't know, uh, but you do care. Same kind of idea. So uh, we go out into these investigations, and uh, we try to set ourselves apart by uh, having fun, hopefully not at the expense of anybody who's well-meaning. Uh, but you know, we're having a good time. It's a, it's a comedy podcast as well as an informational podcast. Uh, and then we make new friends along the way, which is great, until we release the podcast. That's another story we'll get to, <laughs> which is kind of a bummer. Uh, and. We, we try to point out the good as well. We want to make sure that we're representing the things that uh, groups do well. Sometimes, you know, that we're really impressed by or we think we should uh, adopt. So we'll, we'll try to make sure that gets uh, long shrift. And then we want to remain open-minded, which is difficult because, you know, we do come in with a preset worldview. That's unavoidable. You can't go in as a blank slate. 
But both Carrie and I come from a religious background where we can legitimately say that we were once uh, very religious and we, we followed the, the truth as we saw it where it led. And in fact, it was a lot of the, the authors and speakers here who influenced both of us. So we try to, we try to stay consistent to that. So uh, I, I'm not worried about you know, going into Scientology, well, I'm worried about going into Scientology, but not for that reason. Uh, you know, the claims can either rest on their own laurels or not, and if they just happen to be true, well then we'll keep doing the same thing, but it'll be a Scientology podcast. <laughs> All right, so, so normally when I explain the podcast, I kind of break it down in the different types of investigations into certain categories, the fringe science, the uh, spiritual, the religious, uh, but I wanted to kind of break it down a different way to highlight some of uh, the, the things that we go through and the muscles that we've built up over time uh, to, to make this work possible, and the things that we've gotten good at, because they, they do take, they're like muscles, they take some exercise. So this is going to be a little bit, that's not the dark side of what we do, but um, these are some things not to do. So we're very good at absorbing lots of pain. And so that, this includes things like colon hydrotherapy and, uh, okay, yeah, that, if, if you've never even heard of it, the, the term itself explains what you're doing. That was not fun. Uh, but uh, this is a really good example. We did a firewalk, and uh, Richard Wiseman kind of set this up beautifully yesterday. Who here has actually done a firewalk before? Oh, excellent. Okay. Oh, th this side of the room. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I should know. Joe would have. Uh, so here we are in San Diego. We went to, there's this uh, hip hypnosis motivation group. I can't remember the exact title off the top of my head, but uh, the, you know, two, there are a little over a dozen of us went through a two to three hour class together. We learned lots of things about, uh, you know, centering your chakras and finding energy balance, uh, you know, all those important things that you need to get your mind in the right place. Uh, this was also very much a secret-based organization, like, you know, The Secret, where, you know, you put your intentionality out there and the universe responds. So, after we had got our instruction, we went outside as the light was dying, set the fire, watched it slowly die down. About an hour later, it was good to go, or so our instructor told us. So, uh, this is, oh, you can't really see me too well, but I'm there on the far side of that fire. I'm about to walk down it. Thankfully, it's more of a regulation size fire, not like the 60-foot one that uh, Richard Wiseman showed. So, I'm doing my best in this moment to be true to what they told me and just, you know, picture the possibilities and, uh, and, and do exactly what I'm supposed to. So, here I go. Hey! <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you. It's a little nerve-wracking to step out there the first time, even though you know the physics of it, that, yeah, okay, they're poor heat conductors, I've heard all this, it's not really going to hurt me, but, you know, I, I also determined to walk kind of slowly, I wasn't going to, like, you know, rush past it. So, that was great, but then I thought, well, that's not good enough, I want to do, like, an A-B test, and I'm going to go back into this and do it again, like, really angry and uh, mad at the world, and everything's against me. <laughs> so, here I go, let's see how this works. <laughs> All right, still a lot of encouragement from the crowd, and I, I made it just fine. In fact, I felt really good, so I thought, oh, let's do it again, because when am I going to get to Firewalk? You guys are laughing, because you know where this is going. <laughs> All right, so, so here we go. So this time, I held onto the phone. I've never held onto a phone tighter in my life than this moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, just a normal day in the neighborhood, walking around, <laughs> and uh, oh my goodness, hot coals, hot coals, hot coals, hot coals. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That would be a great time to quit. But no, I did it a fourth time and a fifth time. So when am I going to get to walk across hot coals again? You know, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, or twice in a lifetime, I don't know. So, so this is my sixth trip, and I decided this would be a really good time. Uh, by the way, the instructor never said, hey, not a good idea. This, this, doesn't, this doesn't go well. Uh, he's done this for many years, but he was like, yeah, all right, you're ready to go again, do it. So, so this time I decided I'm gonna turn around at the very end on the coals and walk back. So this will be my, <laughs> my sixth and seventh trip. Woo! 
Oh, look at me showboating there. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so uh, the pain doesn't hit you right away. You're filled with adrenaline and like, oh, things are good. This is fun. And uh, so, yeah, we got back and there was just enough time to fill out the survey and tell them how much I love the class. And then the, the rising heat started to build up in my feet. And then I felt like a hamburger. I was, oh, this is what it feels like to be a hamburger. It's like I was walking on the surface of the sun. So this is the bottom of my feet. I'm sorry, there should have been some kind of trigger warning there. But uh, <laughs> this, these are the bottoms of my feet two days later. I have rigorously uh, documented them ever since. Almost two years later, I still have now um, uh, eczema on my right foot, the worst of the two, that was kind of sparked by this. So yeah, the, now you know what not to do in a firewalk. <laughs> All right, so another thing that we absorb is awkwardness. And uh, both Carrie and I, I think, have a, a preternatural or at least unusual ability to uh, absorb and live within the awkward situation and just let it wash over us. So this is a few weeks ago at a church. Oh, is the timer, is the timer moving? Because I just realized it's... I was looking at that and it hasn't changed. Okay, so... <laughs> I'll keep going until someone shouts me off. So this is a, uh, a service a few weeks ago that we attended in Victorville, California, on our way to, uh, well, another investigation. But uh, did any of you hear about these rumors of end-time prophecies on September 23rd? Yeah. Okay, yeah, this is the right crowd for that. So... <laughs> Maybe the planet Nibiru was going to come collide with us, or uh, there was this Revelation 12 prophecy that the, the virgin, which is Virgo in the sky, will give birth to a man child. Really bizarre. Anyways, so we went to this church that was preaching this, and they didn't necessarily believe the world was going to end, but there was going to be this big cataclysmic shift. So we went there on September 22nd to see what their service was like. And uh, we had two... Hours, two hour, over two hours of this. I let that run too long because you had to see the do si -do. That's important. <laughs> there's flags waving and there's people with shofars, you know, the horns, they're blowing. Uh, that was wild. Uh, and boy, it gets you moving, right? Yeah, back into it. We should all do that afterward. <laughs> all right, here's, here's some more awkward uh, white man dancing at a laughter yoga uh, conference. So here we go. Here, watch us not do yoga. This was a delightful group. Uh, so they, they met in a strip mall somewhere, and yeah, there's nothing to do with like yogic stretches or breathing. It's just, it's uh, an excuse for adults to get together and make each other laugh by making silly noises, and uh, it was wonderful. And so uh, we actually highly recommend this one, so do laughter yoga. <laughs> they, they have a phone call line where uh, you can, uh, Let's see, you can uh, like join in, and there's always someone there who's kind of running the session. And they'll just you know, laugh, like, ha, 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 and then you join in with your own laughing. And so we invited our listeners to come join us. So we flooded one call with you know, like 60 people, and it was just this weird cacophony of all these colliding voices and interference, and uh, it sounded a little scary, but uh, everyone was laughing. All right, so another thing we absorb is boredom. And uh, so this is something we've gotten really good at. I think, again, we both had a natural ability to not be able to get bored. It's really hard to bore us. And boy, do people try. <laughs> so, all right. so I'm going to talk over this because, yeah, so to my credit, I had to wake up at 6 a.m. to get on a bus to Tijuana. And this is us at an uh, alternative cancer clinic in uh, Tijuana, one of four that we attended that day. And there's a guy in a white lab coat who is not a scientist. Um, 
telling us about all of these uh, alternative health care, or you know, al alternative uh, cancer treatment options. I'm happy to have my apple at least. Carrie's taking diligent notes, and I am uh, holding a 360 camera that I'm having fun experimenting with. But yeah, that's how I felt about then. Right. Oh, there's the notes, there's the camera. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that was, that was, a, that was a rough investigation. Just, there were a lot of, yeah, it's a long story. So um, yeah, I take notes too. So we take long, copious notes. This is, uh, two, these are two pages from my journal when we uh, went to Amazing Facts. They're another end times prophecy group and they were preaching on the book of Daniel and Revelation and how this is all gonna play down. Turns out they were Seventh-day Adventists, but it took them 12, 13 lectures just to reveal that nugget of information. Uh, and you say, wow, 12 or 13 lectures. Yeah, there were 25. And uh, I attended, I think, 22 of them. So, so there, yeah, 54 pages of notes like that. Scientology beats everybody at boredom. Uh, <laughs> you'd be surprised. They. They do such a good job. I'm, I'm amazed that they didn't look us up sooner, but the, their system is fractured enough that somehow that never actually happened that they, you know, checked to see who we are until uh, we got kicked out, and that's a fun story. But <laughs> there we are. Uh, this is auditing, uh, auditing sessions, and so that empty chair is waiting for me, and there's Carrie leaning over and some other people deep at work recounting some of their most harrowing stories. You can just see the corner of L. Ron Hubbard's bust to the right there, and then there's the little Dianetic symbol, so we got our certificates and everything. But uh, this class, this Dianetics certification, took place over the course of, uh, well, two days, and we spent 22 hours at the LA Org, that big blue building that you always see in the, in the footage, uh, just to take that class. And they were still trying to keep me on Sunday. I had to like run out of there. I gotta go talk to my dad, let me go. Uh, yeah, it was terrible. So none of those were useful to you. I apologize for that, all those th things that we absorb. I don't recommend any of those. But this is another thing that we've learned that I think may actually be helpful. And uh, so I'm calling it absorbing, I'm sorry, actually no, I'm, I'm gonna, Call us absorbing dumb. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break ranks with the grammarists out there. I apologize, but I feel like it well reflects the activity itself. Uh, so we're good at absorbing dumb. And I know some of you are hoping to get some, uh, uh, some summer of UFOs here. So I'll tell you a bit about one of our conferences. We went to two conferences, one in Arkansas, the Ozark Mountains UFO conference this past summer. And we also went to the Joshua Tree uh, no, uh, it was in Joshua Tree, the Contact in the Desert conference. So here we are. I'm pointing the camera at the sky because everyone spotted a UFO and they've gotten really excited. It's like, yes! So I run out to the edge of the crowd. You won't see them, but they're like three times larger than this crowd, which is a little dispiriting. Uh, and in the background, you'll hear David Wilcock speaking. Uh, who's familiar with David Wilcock? Oh, just a few hands. Okay, wow, this guy's crazy. He's, he kind of... He kind of fits like a Alex Jones type mold. He has a different sort of presentation, but he also generates just hours upon hours of content on YouTube. And he believes that the government is run by this uh, shadow cabal. And uh, oh boy, I could go off for a long time on the, the things that he talks about. You'll hear him droning on about Pizzagate. That's uh, sort of what he's referencing, which he, he thinks is a real thing. So uh, I'll zoom in in a second. And you'll see this UFO. Cannot win this thing. All we have to do is not provide loosh. So I'm telling you about stuff in this talk that was very disturbing. I'm telling you about elite pedophilia, satanic ceremonies, advertising this stuff. What that means for me is that this is very serious. They are very serious about their religion. They really do want to follow the precepts of the Georgia Guidestones in which the population of Earth is lowered dramatically to as little as perhaps half a billion people. All right, I already heard the answer out in the audience, <laughs> what, what that mysterious object is. I, I don't know if you've heard, but in many circles in ufology now, they're calling them UAPs, the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. But there's you know, many traditionalists, I think the majority, who kind of frown on that, like, oh, we don't need that new term. Anyways, now, now you're up on the lingo. So here is a David Wilcock at that conference, and he's holding what he said a... It, what he said is a medically perfect replica of a alien-human hybrid, 
and you'd think, oh, that looks like a, a fetus or something. No, it's a grown adult, and it's about five inches tall, and there's, there was this whole race of them living in South America. So even he looked at that UFO and said, guys, it's a plastic bag, stop it, you know. <laughs> That's why he was still talking about, uh, uh, you know, the shadow cabal and all that. So... This is, a, this is a nearby booth, and uh, this uh, gentleman and his wife, I presume, uh, they build all of these pyramids, so you've already got pyramid power. Um, I've been filling it at the Luxor this weekend. And uh, these are organite pyramids. I don't know if any of you have heard of uh, organite or, or, or organ energy. It's kind of like chi energy or bioenergy in that it doesn't exist. But... These generate lots of it, and they shoot it straight up in the air to bust chemtrails. That's awesome, right? <laughs> an imaginary solution to an imaginary problem. So uh, it, I, I highlight them because I, I, the two things happened. Later on that evening, I heard another woman boasting to another lady about the UFO she had seen, so the plastic bag explanation did not register. And then I found their podcast later, and they were talking about that day, and not only did they know the plastic bag explanation, but they clarified that it was a Ross shopping bag. Not my shopping bag, but from the store, Ross. And, and yet, they still felt that it was an alien presence, that they were somehow maybe cloaking themselves as a shopping bag. <laughs> so yeah, we're really good at absorbing the dumb. And, and by, it, you know, I'm, I don't, well, I'm, I'm speaking to a sympathetic audience here. I'm already worried, like, oh no, I'm going to offend somebody. Um, but uh, what that means is that we let it kind of wash over us, we absorb it, we listen to it, we consider it, but we don't react immediately to it. And uh, in, in this case, it's really our only option. What, what else could we do? You know, do I just start muttering angrily in my seat at this conference? Uh, or do I, like, yell at the presenters? They're going to kick me out. So I, I kind of have to, uh, you know, just stay there and take it. Also, it doesn't affect us personally. Uh, you know, we try to make it the same as if we weren't even there. Because if we weren't there, this, these things would still be being said. And, uh, and we'd just be missing out on them. I'll make sure I'm not going too far over time here. So, uh, so just keeping that in mind helps us kind of say, okay, we're just going to listen to it. Now, of course, it's different if someone is being actively harmed uh, or if you know, there's a real danger present. Uh, that's a different situation, of course. Uh, but it allows us time to just listen carefully and uh, be constructive in our response because, again, we don't have that knee-jerk immediate response. And because we're playing along, because we're part of the crowd, uh, even, even if people know that we are uh, skeptical, because you know, we, we present our real selves. We do use our real names, uh, our real credit cards, our, uh, um, our, our real identities. We just don't offer like, hey, we're here for a podcast, and we're going to observe you, and then we're going to like, kind of comically you know, describe what happened here later. We don't offer that particular information. But... <laughs> But in the moment, uh, we're just part of the crowd, and we can talk with them. We can ask questions to get interesting answers. So those are, uh, th that's kind of how we came to absorb the dumb. So uh, this is a very unscientific niceness scale. Uh, <laughs> and this is where I'm arbitrarily putting myself based on uh, feedback that Carrie and I have gotten from people saying, wow, you know, I'm even a member of this religion, but I really liked how you covered us. And boy, that feedback means everything to us. That is like so empowering to hear that, you know, this really resonated with you and you weren't offended. Uh, and then other people say, oh yeah, you're, you're uh, you know, even handed, fair-minded. We really appreciate that. So that's all great to hear. Uh, but of course, not everybody feels that way. Anything you put out in public, of course, is going to uh, get all kinds of negative feedback as well. There, you, you can't not offend somebody, right? So we hear plenty of that too, and we try to take it seriously and see if it's noise or if you know, there's something we really need to be careful of. But generally, it seems like we end up on sort of the nice end of the spectrum, which is really cool uh, that we can uh, do this. And, and neither Carrie nor I like to upset people. That's our personal constitution. Now. What I'm not calling for is for everybody to create nice stuff. Because we need a lot of different voices in our movement. 
So it's important because there are a lot of ears out there. I don't know if this is too abstract, this uh, little illustration I've created, but all these kind of uh, red shapes or ears or people. And so you, know, you send out along the spectrum, you send out your own message, and it's just going to miss some people. And so our show does that as well. But it's going to hit others. And so that's why we need a variety of voices getting our message across because you're going to have a variety of people who want to hear different things. So you need all of the above. But now I'll go back to preaching again. I, I still do think that it is a useful skill to absorb the dumb. And uh, Richard Dawkins brought up a really good point yesterday. He was saying, you know, like when you're in front of an audience of a thousand people and someone says something idiotic, uh, you can call it idiotic. And that's uh, the right time and the right thing to say uh, because it's for those other people. It's not going to move that person that you're talking to. So context is important. But I, I think what I'm suggesting here is more in the terms of interpersonal relationships. Uh, and I think we all experience that far more, even people who have a public forum, we are constantly running into coworkers, family and friends, uh, and random strangers on the internet that we interact with, and we get a lot of dumb. So what do you do with that? So what I'm calling for is a, just a filter that we install. And I know we all have that filter already, so I'm not saying, change your personality or do something you never thought of before, I'm encouraging you to uh, continue to use and exercise that filter. Uh, and, and this is, it's, again, a muscle that you exercise. It's not like a one-time set it and forget it sort of thing. So by absorbing the dumb, it, I'm sorry, I'm checking the time again. Okay, I better wrap up. Uh, so it establishes you as a friendly person. If you are able to take things that people say and just not immediately reflect it back at them, convert it into the form of anger, which often seems to be like a really easy uh, conversion there, then you can be that person that they come back to later and say, hey, you know, a lot of people are jerks about this, but you're a, a good listener, you're someone I can talk to, and then you can eventually get that uh, positive message across. That is planting a seed. And I've already kind of now covered some of these items. I didn't do that in order there, but uh, it inspires that contemplation. It, it inspires, it's kind of like mindfulness meditation. It forces you to stop, absorb, consider, and use that slow brain, you know, that uh, neocortex to evaluate what you're going to say in the next moment. And thankfully for us, there is no law of conservation of dumb. So you truly can kind of absorb it and just not let it radiate, radiate back out into the universe. I'm, I'm talking like the secret now. <laughs> and, and usually I find most of the things I regret saying or doing uh, come from me not following that particular advice. So the more I've used it, the more I have uh, felt, uh, felt it effective. And, and it plants a seed, again, to, to pay off in later dates. Uh, at later times, and to borrow a Christian metaphor. Uh, and so with that, I will just encourage you all to make sure that the people around you know that you could care less. Thank you.